Good morning. This is Business Life with me, Ian King. And Liz Truss has urged the government to change course on the economy and cut taxes. In her first major speech on the economy since she left office, the former Prime Minister defended her mini-budget, which led to the collapse of the pound and ultimately the rapid end to her time at number 10. And it's certainly true that I didn't just try to fatten the pig on market day. I tried to rear the pig, fatten the pig and slaughter the pig on market day. I confess to that. But the reason we were in a rush is because voters had voted for change. In order to grow, we need to change. And that starts with acknowledging that we have a problem. It means abandoning the stale economic consensus. Well, joining me now is our economics editor, Ed Conway. Ed, why should anyone really care what Liz Truss thinks about the economy? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, she was the Prime Minister, I suppose, is the, is the straightforward uh, answer, uh, and took us down, briefly at least, down, down a road which was quite potentially a profound change for the UK. I think what's striking for me, you know, I, I wasn't quite sure what to expect from, from this speech, and a lot of people like you will be kind of asking that question about why we should be still listening to her. Um, the thing I hadn't kind of expected is, actually, when you listen to that bit that we just played, that was something of acknowledgement that she got things wrong. And, and in her case, she's saying, you know, this thing about kind of trying to, uh, what is it, fatten the pig and slaughter it and, 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 and sell it as well. Um, she's kind of casting that as a bit of the problem. To my mind, and, you know, we, we reported this on this kind of uh, very much at the time, to my mind, you know, that was the big problem. I mean, there's a big debate that we can carry on having about what are the optimal rates for tax, about how, you, uh, how much the national debt should be, about how much public spending could be, how you get growth going. All of these things are important debates that we need to continue having, having in the UK. But the issue was, ultimately, that the UK government, uh, with Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng, lost... Credibility. They lost the credibility of markets. And as a result of that, you saw all of those things that we reported on back then. You saw gilt yields going through the roof at the same time as the pound go, getting to the lowest level that we've seen against the dollar in history. It's the, the combination of those two things is really what matters. Um, you had big question marks about uh, whether the UK was going to be able to sell its debt in future. You have big question marks, essentially, that you only tend to hear about countries when they are facing these kinds of credibility crises, as we saw in Greece, as we've seen in many emerging economies around the world. And that was happening about the UK. And it was happening because, in large part, of that rush. Because it was quite, you know, to take another phrase from uh, that the, the Liz Truss didn't use, but she did talk about pigs, it was quite ham-fisted. The way that it was implemented was ultimately ham-fisted. And as a result of that, a lot of people within markets got very scared. And then you had the implications that we all saw. You saw what happened with, uh, with LDIs, with the pension market. That wasn't Liz Truss's fault, but by pushing markets into that place, into that insecurity, um, that precipitated other issues. Uh, bombs and mines that were buried went off. Uh, and that ultimately is the big story. The UK briefly lost credibility. And now we can see with a new Prime Minister, uh, Bank of England's administration still the same. Obviously, guilt yields are a lot higher now because interest rates are higher, but the pound is much stronger. And so there isn't that credibility question over the UK anymore. What I think, though, you know, Liz Truss and her, her colleagues should take some reassurance from is that, you know... I think those debates haven't gone away. You know, I think that people still need to be talking about how to get grow growth going. They need to be talking about what the optimal tax policy is. All of those things that she talked about are still legitimate questions. That stuff shouldn't be dismissed, as some people think. However, the market's verdict was, we don't really like the cut of your jib, and that's why we are selling off UK assets, and we all know what happened next. Thanks, Ed. Some other business news for you now. And the life and savings giant Phoenix Group said this morning it was on the lookout for further takeover targets. After completing its £250 million takeover of Sun Life of Canada's UK arm in April. The company, whose 14 million customers include former policyholders of names such as Britannic, Pearl, Abbey Life and Scottish Mutual, was reporting cash generation of £898 million for the six months to the end of June, compared with £950 million in the same period last year. Phoenix, which writes new policies under the Standard Life brand, also reported £3.1 billion worth of new business net fund flows, up 72% year on year. The shares are currently ahead by some 1%. Pendragon, once the UK's biggest quoted car dealership, is selling its entire motor and leasing business for £250 million to the listed US motor dealer Lithia. 
The businesses changing hands include Evans Hulshaw, Stratstone and Carstore. Lithia entered the UK market in March this year with the acquisition of Hong Kong-based Jardine Matheson's car dealership business Jardine Motors. Following the sale, Pendragon will focus on Pinewood, its dealer management software business, which will be rolled out across Lithia's UK and US businesses. Shares of Pendragon have risen by 27% this morning. And the FTSE 100 paper and packaging group Mondi has become the latest Western business to complete its exit from Russia. It sold its last asset in the country, a pulp packaging and fine paper mill that employs 4,500 people, to the Moscow-based property firm Caesar Group for US$825.7 million. US dollars. Well, the sale follows last week's exit from Russia by British American Tobacco and recent exits by Heineken and Volkswagen. Well, the oil price continues to grind higher on growing expectations of demand outstripping supply. Earlier on this morning, a barrel of Brent crude hit $94.78 a barrel. That was the highest since the 16th of November last year. It's held on to most of those gains, as you can see there. A barrel of Brent crude will currently set you back $94.35 a barrel. That's up just under half of 1% on the session. Well, on the equity market, stocks in the Asia-Pacific region had a mixed session overnight. As you can see there, you can ignore the uh, figure for the Nikkei in the uh, top left-hand corner because Japan was closed for a public holiday today. In Europe, stocks have also been... Uh, well, they're all in negative territory right now, the main continental European indices. Talking points on mainland Europe this morning include the French lender Société Générale. I can tell... Well, we're showing no change. I can tell you the stock price is currently off nearly 9.5%. The new chief executive has been giving a strategic update this morning in which he admitted he expects little growth in coming years. Well, here in London, the FTSE 100 is also in negative territory, a quarter of a point or so lower in what appears to be a broad-based sell-off, the distributor RS Group. They used to be called Electro Components, if you remember them. Uh, the shares off uh, two and three-quarter percent there on broker comment. Not too many gainers to mention, but Ocado Group is ahead by just over 6.5%, while Mondi, which I mentioned a moment or so ago, is up 4 and a quarter percent Outside the FTSE, the oil producer Energen is up by some uh, 2 and 4% uh, right now. It's benefited from a push from one of the brokers. While Drax Group, that you can see on the screen there, that's rallied 2 and 3 quarter percent. There was a big sell-off on Friday afternoon, which was uh, pretty unexplained, so it's clawed back some of those losses today. On the foreign exchange markets, well, the US dollar has been trading at close to a six-month high ahead of this week's interest rate decisions from the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England and the Bank of Japan. At the moment, uh, the pound is up a sixth of one percent against the uh, dollar, more or less unchanged against the uh, euro. Well, joining me now is Russ Mould. He's investment director at AJ Bell. Russ, great to see you Thank this you, morning. Ian. Let's kick off with Mondi because it's quite a, a fillip with the stock price. I mean, the question I would have is... Are they going to get the sales proceeds? Well, I think that's the interesting thing. They are promising that they will distribute the money to shareholders when they get their hands on it, and it will come in six monthly instalments. So that's what they're very much looking for. I think the market is relieved that this deal has been concluded. It was first talked about a year ago, though the price then, I think, was €1.2 billion. Euros, so they've probably got a little bit less than maybe they were hoping for. But if the money comes through, clearly the market's just pleased that you know, they're, they're, they're shot of what's been a, a, probably a very time-consuming operation for them for many reasons. Yeah, but it's... It's whether they get the money, isn't it? I, it I've is. Got real questions over this. I mean, but analysts are forecasting that the dividend will be cut this year. I mean, a cult stock during lockdown when there was a lot of e-commerce and home shopping going on, that's cooled a little bit. It turns out that a lot of um, retailers have overstocked on their packaging, so that's, there's been a bit of indigestion there. Um, but the share price is responding. You are seeing some mergers and acquisitions in the industry. You are seeing some consolidation and some supply coming out because of weak pricing. So even allowing for this deal, whether it goes ahead or not, the shares have been moving up from their lows recently. Yeah. Now, what about Pendragon? How is, this is an extraordinary sort of corporate uh, engineering. I mean, the shares collapsed last Christmas when there was a bid for the company which, which then didn't go through. Um, so you've now got a bit of a different approach from management. Basically saying, we don't want to be a car retailer anymore. We'll sell that to a major US operation who wants to get into this business. And we'll be a software company. And from a market's point of view, if they can achieve this software as a service business, there's an awful lot more visibility, visibility there and higher profit margins there, in principle, than being a car retailer. No disrespect to car retailing and leasing operations. And also the debt and the pension liabilities go away. So you've then got a pure play software platform business, which 
yeah, it seems to be um, tickling a few fancies this morning. Yeah, there's been so much consolidation in this sector. I mean, there it are... is very fragmented, yeah. But there are very few listed motor dealers left to invest in. I mean, there's Inchcape and there's and Lookers. Vir and Virtue, is Virtue still around, I think, possibly? Or is it... Even... I'm not sure now. That's quite a... <laughs> but, yeah, there's not many. No, but, again, it's obviously a very, very cyclical business. And, again, if they consider themselves into a predictable cash-generative software company, you're looking at a very different proposition altogether, potentially. Yeah. Now... We talked every day last week about Arm Holdings and its IPO. The, the, the shares actually sold off on Friday night on Wall Street. They did. There's a bit of log reverse logic to this one. So Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company is the world's biggest outsourced producer of silicon chips. It's about 10% of global supply on its own. There were rumours that it was going out saying, we don't need all the production equipment we thought we needed. Some have said, oh, well, that's because they're having trouble finding people in Arizona. Some have said, for their new facility there, some have said... Maybe it's just that end demand is actually slowing down. Global economy might not be as good as we thought. There's a lot of inventory out there in the system. TSMC, one of its biggest customers is NVIDIA. One of NVIDIA's biggest... And NVIDIA is one of ARM's biggest customers. So there's a little bit of food chain thinking going on there. We'll see how that filters through in the next few weeks. It's very interesting. I mean, I guess a lot of people are still managing their books. It's a limited free float as well. I think a 9%, 10% float is very, very squeezy. And you had a syndicate of 28 banks all telling you how wonderful this company <laughs> yes. was. Which, in many ways, it, it is. It's, I think... It's not whether it's a wonderful company, it's whether the, the price is right and the valuation is appropriate for the company's growth and cash flow profile. Um, yeah, a squeeze, one thing people won't be looking to do is short it and bet against it because the float is so limited. So that does give a, perhaps a little bit of natural support to the price. Yeah, now it's a busy week for central banks this week. What are you looking out for? Well, we've got the Fed on Wednesday, no change expected at 5.5% interest rate. Bank of England on Thursday... I think there's an expectation they might go for one more rate rise and then stop, but one or two have pencilled that in for November. Bank of Japan on Friday, no change, still a complete outlier, negative interest rates and still pushing ahead with quantitative easing. I think the big one from a British perspective will be the Bank of England. There are expectations, again, yeah, maybe one and done. We'll find out. I, I, when my dad first took me horse racing, he always told me never bet upon stewards' inquiries for the stewards know not what they do. <laughs> so I will, I'll leave that to Mr Bailey and his colleagues. <laughs> All right, Ross, got to leave it there. Great to see you this Thank morning. You. Thank you. Still to come here on Business Live, Sir Martin Sorrell warns that recession fears are making advertising clients cautious. I'll be speaking to him after this short break. Don't go away.
slight image, slight better. Fly Emirates, fly better. Thank you. Welcome back. The advertising mogul Sir Martin Sorrell has warned that fears of a recession are making clients spend more cautiously. His company S4 Capital accordingly cut its annual revenue forecast again this morning, causing the shares to hit an all-time low. Operating losses in the six months to the end of June narrowed from £75.4 million last year to £6.4 million this time. I'm very pleased to say Sir Martin Sorrell joins me now. Just one correction. We focused on operational EBITDA and that was actually up on re in reported terms by... 30 to 37 million in the first half and, and in the like for like it was down but um so a little bit of okay. a tweak there on your your intro okay duly noted i mean and it was not it's not a uk advertising yes sort of it's really global. We're, we're a mini global firm. Of course. Now, but I mean, this is the, the point. I mean, you've, you've warned that clients are spending more cautiously. My assumption big would client, be... Big clients have done better. I mean, our top 20, Ian, were up about 7 or 8%. The, the overall firm was up net, net revenue at 5%, or 5.1% to be precise. And the, the, top, the top 20 were up about 8 or 9%. And the top 50 were up about 11%. The bigger clients are probably still, particularly on digital. I mean, you've seen digital advertising up 8 or 9%. Analog is down 8 or 9%. If you have sports like Fox does or, or, um, or Disney has, it protects it a little bit. But the upfronts don't, don't sound as though they're very good in America. So analog advertising under pressure. Digital is remains. It's the smaller regional clients where we've seen the contraction and probably new business activity too. And I'd assume that's mainly in Europe, because, I mean, the US economy on the uh, face of it looks reasonably robust. You, you, I mean, US for us, North and South America were up 7%. Uh, EMEA was up 2 and and AUPAC was down 7 Me Really reflecting what's happening in China, or not happening in China post-COVID, although I think it will come back, but more slowly than people were forecasting at the beginning of the year. So I wouldn't say... You know, I think what's happened, there are two things that are really happening. One is geographical fragmentation, so it's not as global as it was. So North and South America is really important. And me, Middle East is really important. APAC's important. With the caveat around China and Taiwan, so if you're big in China, do you go bigger? If you're small, you probably do go bigger. And big is you know, 18 trillion out of 100 trillion is, is China, so it's about 20%. Apple has 20% of its sales in China threatened to some extent at the moment, but still has it. So that's one thing. And then mid the Europe is seen as a cost centre. I mean, the sad truth is most of our clients, or most of the clients I speak to, say they look at uh, Europe as being cost and, and, and taking out cost. So, so digital transformation and digital is accelerating, particularly driven by AI, which is data-driven too, so it helps plays to our strength. So that's, I think, the two, the two things. Geographical fragmentation and digital transformation are the two things that clients are focused on. In the meantime, fears of recession, you know, listening to people on your programme all the time, um, fears of recession are making clients more cautious. I think that's generally the, the position. The is irony about tech is clients is their ad revenues are up, but their spending is down. I mean, next year, you've got a US presidential election mm -hmm. and the Olympics. I mean, in the old days, you'd have been really excited about it's a, it. It's a bullish year. Well, yeah. I, I, I think things will not change materially in the real world until after the US presidential election, however that goes. I think the economy is good in America. Biden wins. If it's challenged, I think Trump has a better chance than many people give him. Uh, the same is true in the UK. I don't think people are going to move forward in the UK from an FDI or investment point of view until they see what's going to happen government-wise. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty. In the markets that you that you look at voraciously, I think in Q2, maybe Q3, we'll see cuts in, in the American 
rates. Maybe Europe will take longer into Q4. But I think the real world will continue in this state until we clear the political uncertainty, which is considerable at the moment. Now, you touched on old media there for a moment. Yeah. I mean, love to get your reaction to this. A week or so ago, it was reported that uh, Disney's had a $10 billion offer for ABC television, National Geographic, FX. That seems a really, really low ball offer for assets of that quality. Well, I mean, you're going to get... Uh, next star will be a new star, uh, I suppose. In, 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 but, but, no, it's, it's emblematic of the world. I mean, for, for Bob Iger, uh, I think it was at the... Um, Sun Valley Conference uh, on, on CNBC, if I can mention yeah. that, CNBC. Oh, uh, channel, of course. <laughs> that mentioned for the first time, I think, that, you know, he was thinking of selling, partnering on ABC and, indeed, on Hotstar in India, you know, where subscriptions fell by, what, 37% in the, in the second quarter of the year. So I think it, 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 what it shows you is that analogue is under huge pressure. The world media market is about 900, 950 billion. Digital is two-thirds will be three quarters maybe by 2025. This year it's growing, is what I said. The tech companies add revenues, Alphabet, Meta, Amazon, not on fire, but doing pretty well on the ad revenue side. And on the analog side, the reverse is true, that they're down. So, so digital might be up by seven, eight, nine. We th think this year probably by 10 or 11 by when we get to the end of the year. But on analog, it's down seven or eight percent, unless you have sport, which ESPN, you know, Disney has through ESPN, and and others have, like Fox ha have as well. And so that ameliorates it, but it's still down. So analogue under pressure, you see it with ITV here. I mean, the pressures they're under and, you know, they move into production, etc. Martin, always good to see you. Thank you, Ian. Got to Thank leave you very on, much. Talk to you all day, but... Uh, <laughs> Challenging day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, and thank you for fronting up on such okay. circumstances. It's always appreciated. Good. Now, if you bought something on Google Play or Microsoft's Xbox Store, the chances are your life has been touched by Bango. The Cambridge-based software company's technology makes it simpler for businesses to charge for goods and customers to pay for them. Its other customers include Amazon and Samsung. Today, it reported an 88% rise in sales to 20.3 million US dollars for the six months to the end of June. Well, joining me now is Paul Larby, who's chief executive of Bango. Uh, Paul, welcome to you. I mean, you offer various services. Where are sales growing most strongly just now? Yeah, for us, the sales are really growing in what we call our digital vending machine, and that's the technology of the Bango platform enabling you as a consumer to go to one place and see all of your subscription services in one place. We all have so many subscription services now, not just video and gaming and music, but home delivery services, lifestyle services. Being able to see all those in one place and manage all those in one place is really what the Bang Bango platform enables. And we're working with telcos so that telcos who have, you know, utility network-based services can differentiate those services by adding on these exciting third-party services. It gives them more revenue and it gives them a stickier subscriber and more engagement with that customer. Now, last year, you bought the uh, digital payments business of NTT Docomo, big uh, Japanese mobile business. How much did that contribute during the period? Yeah, that was so. The first half of this year is the first time we've had a sort of a full six months of uh, acquired revenue uh, from that from that business. And just as a reminder, we acquired it for the customers and the contracts. The goal is to migrate all of those uh, customers onto the Bango platform that allows us to realise these huge amounts of cost synergies. That business acquired business is performing as we expected. It, like Bango, has a bit of a forty sixty uh, weighting. Uh, the Japanese yen, as we heard about a little earlier on the program, is, is sort of struggling against the US dollar. That's been a bit of a headwind for that business. But really, it's performing as we expected. And the synergies of integrating that on the Bango platform and realising that 21 million of annualised cost synergies, which will give us a big step up in EBITDA in the end of this year and 24 and beyond, is, a, is ahead of where we expected it to be. I mean, your losses were up during the period. I assume that is exclusively because you are migrating uh, the Doco business to your own platform. Yeah, absolutely. That's a bit of a bit of a drag from the the sort of the, uh, the the acquired pieces. And when we execute those synergies, there's always a gap between us executing the synergies and actually realising the savings in the in the in the EBITDA. But you'll see that unfold in the second half of this year, and then in 2024, as we move into 2024, we become a very high margin, very cash flow generated business. You mentioned just now the fact that you are targeting telco customers who are selling a lot of third party uh, subscriptions. Do you worry about the fact that potentially consumers are, are cancelling subscriptions in some cases? There's a lot of anecdotal evidence to suggest that. 
Yeah, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence to that. When we look at the data we have across the across the world, and we manage a huge number of subscriptions globally, I guess we don't see that, and we actually see this opportunity to bundle subscriptions in one place actually as it's sort of a, a it benefits from this sort of overall you know spending squeeze because if you can see all your subscriptions if it's very clear what you're spending on subscriptions if you can get promotions that give you better value you're more inclined to, to take those up one of our american customers very recently launched a big promotion around the end, start of the nfl season and the sunday ticket and they saw a huge surge in the number of subscriptions that were managed through the platform so i think if you put the right offer together at the right time at the end of the day, you know, many of these services are entertainment. So we might not go on holiday, we might go to a cheaper supermarket, we might not go out for dinner, but we're still going to need entertainment services. And that's what a lot of these provide. Now, Cambridge is obviously a very hot place right now, uh, Paul. Are you still hiring? Are you still, is, that, is it a challenge for you to get the right people? Yeah, so we're a, we're a global company. One of the benefits actually of the acquisition was that we acquired a huge team of people that are not just good engineers, but with domain expertise. So yeah, it's uh, it's all Cambridge itself is always a always a hot market. We're very fortunate. We have a huge employee engagement uh, score as the Cambridge offer. Everybody in the company is a shareholder. It's a great and fun place to work. We have a very strong culture. So actually, we've we've not seen massive wage inflation. We've not seen massive churn throughout any of this. In fact, if anything, we've continued to grow. And and, and Bangor is a place that people want to work. And I think if you make a you make great technology that people can touch and people can realise, then good people want to work there. And do you think the market's still giving you credit for uh, what you've done so far? No, I think absolutely not. If you can look at our share price, you know, where we, we think we're way undervalued, not just on where we are today, but on but on but on what's to come. But at the end of the day, the, the market is who do it is. We're fortunate to have some very long standing, very big shareholders who've been with us a long time and, and really recognize the future value in that market. But is there anything in a, in a, as a small to mid cap in the UK, you're very, very subject to private uh, private investor fluctuations. Indeed. Paul, it's lovely to talk to you today. Thanks very much indeed for joining me. Brilliant. Nice to meet you, Ian. That's it from me. I'm back at half past four this afternoon when my guests will include Andy Briggs, the chief executive of Phoenix Group. Do hope you can join me for that. See you later. Cheerio. <laughs>